Ancient Merv Merv is the name of one of the most important historical cities, and almost nobody has heard of it before. Even its name is boring. You might know somebody named Merv, but the name doesn't really make you think of an ancient place in the desert of Turkmenistan. Merv served as the capital of several empires over the course of its 4,000 years of life. It looks like a crumbling desert ruin now, like it was never even a city to begin with. But during the days of the Silk Road, Merv was a magical crossroads between civilizations. Situated at a strategic spot between the Afghan highlands and the dry lowlands of the Karakum Desert, everyone wanted a piece of Merv. The Greeks wanted to conquer it, so did the Turks, Persians, and Arabs. Alexander the Great himself was desperate to bring the city under Macedonian control. Merv's early history is so confusing that scholars don't even know exactly who founded the city. Roman author Pliny the Elder claimed it was Alexander 2,300 years ago, but nobody knows. I might not be able to tell you exactly who founded the city, but I can tell you how it evolved into a mystical place bursting with culture. Merv was an international hub of trade where traditions clashed and strange smells wafted from cook fires. Merv began in very ancient times as an oasis, but as the years went by and the Silk Road became an important trading route, the city grew exceedingly popular. As it changed hands from one empire to another, the population of Merv spiraled out of control. It went from a tiny oasis town to what was likely the third biggest city anywhere in the world. It had a population of around 500,000 people. Merv might have remained one of the biggest cities in the world, if not for what happened in 1221. It was a disaster of unspeakable proportions. The fourth son of legendary conqueror Genghis Khan led his Mongol army through the city gates. His name was Tului Khan, and he may have been even more ruthless than his old dad. The Khan ordered every single person in the city of Merv to be slaughtered. If what the historical records say is true, this could have been the worst slaughter in human history. The Mongols are said to have killed anywhere between 700,000 and 1 million people. They even killed the refugees who were seeking shelter as they desperately fled the carnage. The attack was so destructive that Merv was abandoned and never occupied again. But things are different today. The glory of Merv is shining once again thanks to the Turkmenistan government. When UNESCO declared Merv a World Heritage Site in 1999, efforts were put in place to rejuvenate the broken city. Now you can behold a handful of Merv's medieval ruins and even see the ruins of the original Bronze Age settlement from 4,500 years ago. The magic of the Silk Road is best experienced right here in Central Asia. Anyone want to go? Or have you already? Let me know in the comments! The Viking Fortress When you think of the Vikings, the first thing that comes to mind is likely looting and pillaging. The Vikings are notorious for being bloodthirsty warriors who raided Europe's coastlines from Russia to Ireland 1,000 years ago. But there's more to the Vikings than just stealing shiny things and rowing boats. They were also fantastic builders. On the Danish island of Zealand, archaeologists recently discovered the ruins of an amazing Viking fortress. It was the first fortress of its kind to be found in Denmark in the last 60 years. Scientists were thrilled, to say the least. Prior to this discovery, scientists had only ever found three Viking fortresses in the country, Firkat, Agersborg, and Trelborg. Each fortress was built in a circular shape, hemmed by ramparts and accessible only through gigantic gates. Each gate was typically built at one of the four points of the compass, according to Nana Holm from the Danish Castle Center. Nana was one of the scientists involved in the new discovery. Just like the other three fortresses, the one on the island of Zealand was perfectly circular and protected by megalithic gateways. Nana Holm says it is huge, about 476 feet across. It wasn't a sprawling city by any means, but it was a mighty stronghold that the Vikings would have protected to the deaths. It was the Viking version of a castle, covered in Scandinavian snow and overlooking the beautiful Koge River Valley. Shambhala in ancient texts from the Tibetan Plateau to the deserts of India, there is a place mentioned over and over again. For thousands of years, Shambhala has been described as a mythical Buddhist kingdom, a place renowned for its wisdom and peace. 
The people of Shambhala never age, never suffer, and never desire material things. Was Shambhala ever a real place? Or is it just a legend? The truth is a lot trickier than you might think. Shambhala has been known by many names over the years. It's been called the Land of the Living Gods, the Forbidden Land, and the Land of White Waters. In Hindu mythology, it's known as Aryavartha, which translates roughly to the Land of the Worthy Ones. In China, they call it Tsi Tian. Even the Russians have a name for it, Belovodye. These days, it's often called Shangri-La. Although the mythical land of peace and harmony appears in multiple texts, too many to count, there is one in particular that's the most important. The first extensive discussion of a kingdom called Shambhala comes from the Kala Chakra, a book on esoteric teachings written by Tibetan Buddhists. They describe Shambhala as a real city, but one that can only be reached by a person who has reached inner peace. Only through achieving karmic connection can a person get to Shambhala. In that way, it's explained as more of a metaphysical place, accessible only through the mind. There are other ideas and theories about Shambhala. In many Tibetan teachings, it's said Shambhala will reveal itself in the days of apocalyptic events. When barbarians are united under an evil king, the mists of the snowy mountains of the Himalayas will rise, and there Shambhala will be seen in all of its brilliant glory. The king of that city will come with an army to vanquish the dark forces, and from then on, the world will fall into a golden age. So, you want to know the truth? Was there ever a city named Shambhala, and who built it? The Nazis, as much as I hate bringing them up, believe that Shambhala was built by the Aryans and is hidden somewhere underneath the Himalayas. The Nazis also believed in another mythical city called Agarti, also buried beneath the great mountains. There could indeed have once been a shining city built by an unidentified mountain culture. The Mongolians believe that Shambhala was located in a valley in Siberia somewhere. The people of the Altai Mountains believed it could be reached through Mount Beluka. But as of right now, nobody has ever found physical evidence to prove any of the theories. Abu Simbel Abu Simbel is one of the most phenomenal places in Egypt. Its twin temples were built by legendary king Ramses II just a little over 3,000 years ago. But there is a modern twist to this magical place. Every single piece of Abu Simbel was dismantled and put back together again after the construction of a dam. It was one of the most epic archaeological projects in Egyptian history. Before I talk about the dam, I want to tell you about the history of the temples. They were constructed at the second cataract of the Nile starting around 1264 BC. The temple complex was carved into the solid rock cliff next to the river. Hieroglyphics and inscriptions have revealed all the truths archaeologists wanted to know about the place. That's one great thing about ancient Egypt, they really did a good job of writing things down. The inscriptions say the temple complex was built primarily to celebrate the victory of the Egyptians over the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh. This was in 1274 BC. The monument was built right on the edge of Nubia, which the Egyptians had also conquered. It was a testimony to the strength of Egypt. What you might find really interesting is that it took about 20 years to complete construction. You know what else took 20 years to complete? The building of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The Great Temple, the bigger of the two, was dedicated to Ramses' favorite gods, Ra, Ta, and Ramses himself. He fancied he was a god and often tried to immortalize himself in massive stone statues. The smaller temple, literally called the Small Temple, was for his favorite wife, Nefertari. It was dedicated to the goddess Hathor. Now that you know its history, let me tell you about its discovery. The way this place was found was so amazing you're going to think I'm making it up. In 1813, a Swiss explorer by the name of Burkhardt was led to the site by a young boy named Abu Simbel. When the explorer reached the ruins, he could barely see them because they were completely covered in sand. I'm talking almost 100 feet of sand totally burying the temples and the humongous colossi of Ramses II. Going forward in time to the 1960s, the Egyptian government needed to build the Aswan High Dam. This would cause the temples to be completely submerged. So, for four long years, archaeologists dismantled and moved the whole site 213 feet up. It cost a little over $40 million, but it was worth it. You can see this place for yourself today and marvel at the amazing Egyptian engineering. The Palace of Aigai 
In 336 BC, Alexander the Great was crowned king of Macedonia. He was only 20 years old, hardly more than a teenager, yet he would quickly become one of the greatest conquerors the world has ever known. His father, King Philip II, had been assassinated by a political rival. Alexander took the throne unexpectedly and right away began to subdue his rivals. He brought all of Greece and Macedonia under his control, and then he embarked on an invasion of Asia. He built new cities, he destroyed the Persian Empire, and he tore a path all the way to the Ganges in India. Twelve years after Alexander was crowned king, he died. By the age of 32, Alexander had forged one of the largest empires of any civilization ever. What have you accomplished by 32? This isn't a story about Alexander, though. It's a story about a palace in Greece. When Alexander was crowned king in 336 BC, it happened at the mystical palace of Aigai. The 2,400-year-old ruin was just reopened in Greece for all to see. The spectacular palace was formerly known as the Royal Metropolis of the Macedonians. Archaeologists believe it was built by Philip II when he was young in the 4th century BC. When it was finished, the palace may have been the largest building in the country. Unfortunately, it's hard to say just how spectacular it was because very little of the palace is still standing today. You have to really use your imagination to see how magical of a palace this once was, especially as a young Alexander bent his knee and received the crown of his people. The palace didn't stand for very long. The rise of the Roman Empire saw Alexander's own empire torn asunder. In 148 BC, the Romans destroyed the palace. Now, the Greek government has finished 16 years of work restoring it. Over 15,000 square feet of mosaics were put back together. Along with the marble floors and a handful of columns, it's considered one of the most important places in Europe. Key Castle Europe isn't the only place populated by medieval castles. All across the southern regions of mainland Japan, mountain castles called Kodai Sanjo still dominate the landscape. These castles were built in the 7th and 8th centuries, but more often than not were left unfinished. There is one, however, that was completed. It's called Key Castle, one of the coolest fairy tale places in Japan. Key Castle was built during the years of the Yamato dynasty after they defeated the unified forces of Tang China and the Silla Empire of Korea. It was built specifically to be a defensive bulwark against any possible invasion. That's why the castle was positioned on the edge of a mountain near the coast, for invaders. In Japanese, its name means Demon Castle. Because of its unusual name, there have been stories told about the structure for over a thousand years. Local folklore says the castle was once home to a legendary demon named Ura. Key Castle is old, legendary, and considerably impressive. It has 1.7 miles of walls. It originally included smiths for blacksmiths to work day and night. The fortress had watchtowers and defensive systems. It had all the sophisticated features you would expect with a medieval castle. Archaeologists have even found pieces of pottery and iron tools, suggesting the site could be older than anyone realizes. Alas, Key Castle didn't prove much use. Not long after its construction, it was abandoned. A group of Buddhists moved into the empty fortress and stayed there until the 12th century. Then they too forsook its dark halls. Key Castle has been sitting quietly on the mountainside ever since. Prambanan Centuries ago on the island of Java, Buddhism and Hinduism lived in quiet harmony. No place is this more evident than at the Prambanan temples, a place of grace and beauty where the sunset transports you to another world. This amazing temple complex sits amidst the lush landscape of Indonesia's fruitful jungle. It's about 40 hectares large, so visitors should be ready for a day of exploration. There are three main temples, but a total of almost 300. Prambanan is not quite as overwhelming as the dizzying Angkor Wat complex, which can take nearly a week to explore. But both Southeast Asian locations do offer a feeling of nostalgia for a time far removed from today. Adventuring in these ruins can make you feel as if you've been transported to the 9th century. Prambanan is, without a doubt, the largest Hindu temple in Indonesia. The largest temple within the complex is dedicated to Shiva, the destroyer. Its tallest peak rises around 150 feet in the air. It's so big that you can always know where you are in the complex because its tower pokes up above all the other temples. 
The two other important temples are dedicated to Brahma, the creator, and Vishnu, the sustainer. All three are major Hindu gods. Now it's time for a bit of history. Everything about Pramanat is shrouded in mystery. Did that just rhyme? Hindu influences from India arrived around the 1st century AD in Java. The temples couldn't possibly be more than 2,000 years old. By 400 AD, Hindu and Buddhist merchants had settled in Java, married into the local population, and spread their beliefs. In the years that followed, Indonesia developed a unique religion that mixed their ancient culture with the belief systems of India. Though funnily enough, Indonesia currently has the highest Muslim population of any country in the world. As for the construction itself, it likely started in the 9th century and finished by 950 AD. One legend says a Javanese princess was turned to stone by her cruel and nasty husband. But then she became a statue of the Hindu goddess Durga, which still decorates the exterior of the temple. The really crazy part is that about 100 years after the temple was built, the whole complex was abandoned. Researchers think it may have been a volcanic eruption that frightened everybody away. That would do it for sure. Castro de Baronia one of the most picturesque prehistoric settlements anywhere in the world is in Spain. The ancient village sits at the very edge of the country, just inches away from the crashing waves of the Atlantic Ocean. It's a miracle the settlement has survived because it has been blasted by ceaseless winds for thousands of years. These days, the very place where early humans loved and lost is next to a cafe bar and a nude beach. The name of the fortified settlement is Castro de Baronia. It was built in the 1st century BC on a peninsula jutting out into the ocean. This must have seemed like an excellent defensive position for the people who chose the spot. They dug a massive moat 12 feet wide and 10 feet deep, forming a line of defense between the mainland and their village. Then they built a humongous rampart with stone walls to keep out sneaky invaders. The main wall is still preserved, though it's not in the best of shape. To the very right of the entrance was a protective tower where defenders could rain arrows down on their enemies. Inside the fortress, beyond the defensive walls, are the stone remnants of 20 roundhouses. The houses are not particularly large, but they sure had an epic view. Who cares if you live in a stone house when it's beachfront property on the coast of Spain? Archaeologists have unearthed forges, hearths, benches, and other everyday features of the roundhouses. Hearths would have been particularly important because even in Spain, the Atlantic wind can be incredibly cold. People here most likely ate a diet of seafood, but also had cattle and goats. They weaved textiles and worked with metal. They may have been primitive, but they were still intelligent humans. Sadly, I have no information on what happened to the people who lived on this tiny peninsula. Their beautiful piece of paradise was abandoned by the 1st century AD and has remained empty ever since. The City of Jin The nation of Oman is not exactly a popular tourist destination. People aren't flocking to the Omani Desert in the way they flock to the Egyptian Desert, but they should, because deep in the interior of Oman is the mystical oasis town of Bala. It's home to legends of camel-eating hyenas that breathe fire and mages who turn men into donkeys. Its reputation for magic is unparalleled. The mystery of the city, which many call the City of Jin, is alive and well. The isolated desert settlement is still shunned today by many people in Oman because of the stories attached to it. Since before Islam was even a thing, folklore has labeled Bala an evil place, which is really shocking when you look at it from a technical point of view. It's a gorgeous desert oasis, dotted with tall palm trees and spectacular swimming holes. Bala looks like a fairy tale paradise. It is also home to abandoned brick homes and ruins from a time forgotten. It's one of the oldest inhabited settlements in Oman, and apparently is haunted by genies. Genies, jinn, they go by many names. In the Arab world, they are all the same thing, supernatural beings. Hamad al-Rabani works as a tour guide at the medieval fortress in Bala. According to him, a popular myth states the wall around Bala was built in one night by supernatural forces. A pair of jinn or genie sisters built the wall to protect the people inside from a group of invaders. In fact, pretty much everything is blamed on genies. Jinn even supposedly created the irrigation system for agriculture. These genies don't really sound so bad. Raven Sir Odd 
Did you know England has its very own lost city of Atlantis? It's called Ravensir Odd, a mysterious port town built at the mouth of the Humber estuary centuries ago. Archaeologists believe they might be on the brink of finally finding the city's location after 650 years of uncertainty. Historical records show Ravensir Odd was built as a prosperous harbor and trade center in 1235 AD. It grew to have around 100 houses and a busy dockside market. There were warehouses, wharves, and even a jail. Local government was able to collect dues from over 100 merchant ships stopping in the harbor every year. Then, a ferocious storm in the middle of the 1300s saw Ravensir Odd sucked into the sea. It wasn't destroyed because of vengeful gods like in the story of Atlantis. It was climate change that was its undoing. Scientists think it must have happened during the winter of 1356. An incredible storm descended on Europe with the fury of Zeus. Years of erosion had already weakened the foundations of Ravens or Odd. The quiet medieval port, likely in one great sweep, was swept away by the storm and floated off into the sea. But where is the city now? Scientists can't seem to find it, which has made the town begin to look more like a myth than a reality. Professor Daniel Parsons from the University of Hull recently used a sophisticated sonar system to search for it. However, the search was a total failure. Daniel believes subsequent scans will reveal the bones of the town, but that's yet to happen. Hamukale Moving from the cold winds of Britain to the heat of Turkey, let me introduce you to a historical paradise. In English, it's called Cotton Castle, but its real name is Pamukkale, a group of healing springs perched above the ruins of a sacred city. It's a truly magical place, like something out of a storybook. Pamukkale has hosted many civilizations over the years. The healing waters of the springs, rich in calcium and bubbling hot, have been used as a thermal treatment center since they were first discovered. The earliest record of a spa here goes back to the 2nd century BC. King Eumenes of Pergamum was so impressed by the springs that he established the city of Hierapolis directly on top of them. With such a fantastic natural resource at their disposal, the people of Hierapolis flourished. They continued flourishing with mostly peace even as they were conquered by the Roman Empire. But then, in the year 60 AD, an earthquake struck. The temples crumbled, the baths split apart, and the arches folded in on themselves. It was utterly devastating, but not the end. With Pamukkale's healing waters, Hierapolis was not about to be abandoned forever. The city was rebuilt. In 330, Hierapolis became one of the most important religious centers of the newly established Eastern Roman Empire. Instead of temples to the old Greek gods, the city was now home to beautiful early churches. The Lake Bled Church It's hard to find a more magical church than the one on an island in the middle of a Slovenian lake. The Church of Mary the Queen, also called the Pilgrimage Church of the Assumption of Mary, is one of few churches you can only reach by boat. It's at the center of Lake Bled, which itself is inside a quaint medieval town. If you ever choose to visit Lake Bled's church, it's a journey that will make you feel as if you've been taken back to the 16th century. And while this isn't a travel channel, I'll give you a piece of advice. Autumn is the best time to visit because the trees on the island turn beautiful hues of orange, yellow, and red. You won't find a more striking place to visit in all of Slovenia. Now let me tell you a bit about the church's history and why it's such a remarkable religious building. In the 7th or 8th century, a shrine was built on the empty island in dedication to the Virgin Mary. Over the years, the shrine was rebuilt and improved. It kept growing until, in 1465, the church's bell tower stood 170 feet above the island. The church was decorated with marvelous medieval frescoes, and in 1543, the wishing bell was installed. Legend has it that anyone who rings the bell can have one wish granted. But the wish must be benevolent, and you can only make one. Hegra the city of Hegra was built by one of the greatest civilizations the world has ever seen in the 1st century BC. The Nabataeans, the builders of the much more famous Petra, built Hegra as their secondary trading hub. It wasn't as big or as important as Petra, but it was still monumental. And for the last 2,000 years, 
It has stood undisturbed and largely undamaged in the Saudi Arabian desert. But who were the Nabataeans? If they were so important, why doesn't anybody remember their name? It's because they were overshadowed by the Roman Empire. Starting about 2,400 years ago, the Nabataeans dominated the spice trade. They secured trade corridors through Arabia, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, the Mediterranean, and Mesopotamia. They were the Amazon of the 1st century BC. But they didn't sell cheap knickknacks. They traded in peppercorn, sugar, cotton, and ginger root. Frankincense and myrrh were also highly prized for religious ceremonies. According to archaeologist Leila Neme with the Hegra Archaeological Project, the Nabataeans became amazingly wealthy. Too wealthy for the Romans to handle. In the first century, the Romans stole their lands and took over their trading routes. The Nabataean culture was obliterated. Not much of their history remains, though hopefully their memory will live on through the ruins of Hegra. This magical place is home to 111 carved tombs, each of them preserved underneath the clear, starry night sky of Arabia's desert. Camlet Moat If the myths are to be believed, King Arthur held court at Castle Camelot sometime around the 5th century AD. Most modern scholars regard him as nothing but a fictional character, a legendary king dreamed up by a Welsh monk named Nennius, and perhaps poet Chrétien de Troyes in the 12th century. But there are many more who believe that King Arthur was real, and that Camelot is a legitimate place somewhere in England or Wales. There have been dozens of sites across Britain proposed as the real location for King Arthur's coat. One of them is Camlet Moat, a place that's magical even if the myths aren't true. The ancient history of Camlet Moat is obscured by local folklore. Legend has it that in 1440, a mysterious house known as the Manor of Camelot was demolished in the beautiful woodland. The material from the demolished house was sold, and the money used to repair the nearby Hertford Castle. The disassembled manor was, supposedly, all that remained of King Arthur's original castle. Today, Camlet Moat is a wide circle of water protecting a little island of trees. There was once a wooden drawbridge that crossed the moat, the frame of which was excavated in 1923. A small piece was supposedly found a few years ago and dated to 1357. It's obvious there was once a structure in the center of the moat, but all of it is gone now. What remains is a pit that looks like a crater left over from when the pieces of the old structure were stolen. Absolutely nothing original remains of whatever stood here. Only the moat filled with swampy woods water. Maybe it was King Arthur's castle, or maybe a rural hunting lodge. Do you think King Arthur was real? Let me know in the comments below. The city of Volubilists. The Romans built a lot of magical places. From Hadrian's Wall in England to countless ruins in Turkey, the Romans left their mark across Europe, North Africa, and the Levant. But there is one ruin that's a little more magical than others. It's the destitute remains of a city named Volubilis, considered the best-preserved Roman ruin in Morocco. Volubilis was founded before the era of Christianity, prior to the height of the Roman Empire. At the time, Morocco and the surrounding area were part of the Kingdom of Mauritania. This was the farthest extent of the Roman Empire, making Volubilis one of their most isolated cities. Even so, its distance from the heart of Rome never proved too big of an issue. The city thrived well into the 3rd century AD, sprouting walls and growing 20,000 residents. So much olive oil was produced here that the people became filthy rich. They were able to build grand palaces and mansions. Not everybody was rich, though. In the year 40, local residents started to revolt against their Roman oppressors. Holding a key city that very recently belonged to an independent kingdom is more difficult than you might think. The locals revolted, with disaster narrowly avoided when they were all granted Roman citizenship. Still, the indigenous Amazigh people of the wild desert never forgot their heritage. By 285, they were too strong to be contained. The Romans were forced to leave, though the residents still spoke Latin and had adopted 200 years of Roman culture. It wasn't the Romans who destroyed the city, but rather the appearance of Islam in the 8th century. Islamic conquest saw the churches in the city destroyed. The city hung on by a thread, 
with residents sticking around until the 11th century. Long after the Roman Empire collapsed, Bulubilis was still a functioning city in the Moroccan desert, but the damage had been done, and Volubilis was ultimately swallowed by the restless sands. Mistras Mistras can be found in Greece's Laconia region, not far from Sparti, home of the ancient Spartans. It's a mysterious place of myth and legend, an ancient castle town whose secrets are buried underneath green rolling hills and ruins from the Byzantine era. After the fall of Rome and before the fall of Constantinople, Mistras was the second most important town in the empire. What empire? The Eastern Roman Empire, of course, which lasted all the way until the Middle Ages. Even as important as Mistras was, it couldn't survive the ravages of time. Very little of the original city remains, but its magic can still be felt in the air, and in the crumbling wreckage of Byzantine churches and the streets of the new village built beneath the medieval castles. The most breathtaking structure still standing in Mistras is the Palace of Despots. It was the second most important royal building outside the main palace in Constantinople. The palace was constructed much later in the empire's history, around 1350 BC. The surviving ruins stand at the precipice of a hill, giving the best possible view of the plain of Sparta below. Just try to imagine standing on a balcony here years ago, looking out over the quiet plains where Spartan warriors once marched off to war. Sadly, the romanticism of the city ended with the invasion of the Ottomans in 1460. Although the city wasn't destroyed, it was occupied by the Ottomans and the magic died. By 1832, Mistras was an abandoned ruin, but it still stands and is still evidence of one of the Byzantine Empire's most amazing cities. Thanks for watching! Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed! The Underground Labyrinth of Buddha Castle Underneath the 13th century Buddha Castle is a labyrinth of twisting paths, black corridors, and spooky ancient history. The underground caves and passages here were carved out naturally by thermal waters long before prehistoric humans used them as shelter 350,000 years ago. So yes, these tunnels have been used for a very, very long time. There are about 4,000 feet of them underneath modern Budapest, the capital city of Hungary. Buda Castle was built by King Bela IV directly above entrances to the ancient chambers. In the time between then and now, the tunnels were used for some pretty, let's say, interesting things. During the Ottoman occupation, the caves were used as a harem. Several female skeletons have been found deep in the depths of the tunnels, likely victims of some terrible tragedy at the hands of their masters. But the labyrinth was also used as a prison, a torture chamber, and by Dracula himself, though not by choice. In 1462, Vlad Tepes of Wallachia was imprisoned in the dark belly of the labyrinth and brutally tortured. When he exited the cave after unknown years of imprisonment, he went on to become Vlad the Impaler. But there are stranger, more mystical things in the labyrinth as well. There are humanoid statues still standing in the tunnels, so strange archaeologists have no idea what they are. Considering the tunnels and chambers have been used for some of the darkest practices of humanity since before medieval days, it would be no surprise to learn they were once the meeting place for those practicing dark magic. Nobody knows exactly what it is, but there is just something about the underground labyrinth that attracts the vilest forms of evil. The Sculptor's Cave The Sculptor's Cave is located on the south shore of Moray Firth in Scotland. It earned its name after archaeologists found a series of intricate carvings from 1,500 years ago. Excavations began in 1928 and have been revealing amazing things in the cave ever since. Not only are there mysterious Pictish symbols carved all over the cave's walls, but archaeologists have also found mummified bodies, ancient Roman coins, and pieces of gold jewelry dating back 3,000 years. The ancient people of Moray believed the sculptor's cave to be a place of great importance. 3,000 years ago, in what we call the Late Bronze Age, the Moray people brought the remains of dead children here. But they didn't bring them into the cave to bury. Instead, they would mummify the children and then put them on display on racks at the entrance to the cave. For the past century, archaeologists and historians alike have been struggling to figure out why they did such a bizarre thing. 
The best theory that anyone has is that the Moray people associated the cave with magic. Dr. Lindsay Buster with the University of York suggested prehistoric people viewed the sculptor's cave as a mystical place that could touch the afterlife. To help deceased children navigate the treacherous path between life and death, they may have put them at the entrance of the cave to make their journey easier. Researchers believe something about the dark and dank tunnels made them think that by putting the bodies here, the children wouldn't have as far to go when they journey into the underworld. Greenan Fort Legend has it that Greenan of Aliach in Ireland was constructed by a god. In truth, the stone ring fort was built around the year 600. The site itself was used by the original inhabitants of Ireland since 1700 BC. There was always a structure here, though it was often destroyed and then rebuilt. The very last structure was broken to pieces in the year 1101 by King Murdoch O'Brien of Munster. It wasn't discovered again until the 1830s, when it was nothing except a ring of old rocks. The fort is 77 feet wide, and its walls were once 8 feet tall. The remains of a Christian church have been found nearby, as well as burial mounds significantly older. In terms of artifacts, everything from ancient board games to animal bones have been uncovered in and around the site. Considering the hilltop on which the ring fort was built has been an important place for around 4,000 years, it should come as no surprise that the ancients believed it to be a magical place. A very old well behind the walls of the fortress once supplied water to the villagers. These villagers believed the water was magic, able to heal the sick and bring good luck. In the year 450, St. Patrick was allegedly baptized in that very well by a local chieftain. There is one last bit of magic from inside the ring fort. Well, maybe it's not magic so much as superstition. It's said that if you tell a secret within the walls of the fort, everyone will find out. However, some archaeologists believe the superstition may have stemmed because of the fort's amplifying properties, meaning it was more of a literal warning. If you told someone a secret, your voice would bounce off the walls and everyone would hear you. Sumerian Stargate in the 1920s, a stargate was allegedly discovered in Baghdad. A stargate is believed to be an ancient portal created by extraterrestrials. Some believe stargates were made all over the world so that aliens could come and go as they pleased. They could simply walk through a stargate and be standing on Earth. While none of this has ever been verified, there are plenty of theories. Some believe aliens used the stargates to visit ancient civilizations and bestow secret knowledge upon them, thereby pushing humanity into the modern age. The alleged stargate in Iraq would have originally been installed about 5,000 years ago in what was then ancient Mesopotamia. It was the Sumerians who would have seen the installation of the stargate and who would have witnessed the aliens walking through it as if by magic. This leads ancient alien theorists to believe that the gods and aliens were perhaps the same. For those who don't know, it was the Sumerians who worshipped the Anunnaki. Historians say the Anunnaki were nothing but made-up deities, no different from Zeus or Poseidon. But there are still people out there who believe they were actually aliens. There are even ancient pieces of artwork left behind by the Sumerians that show strange humanoid creatures appearing through gateways that look an awful lot like portals. This stargate was supposedly discovered in the ancient city of Ur, then taken and hidden somewhere unknown. We have absolutely no proof of this, only vague stories. Some have even suggested that America invaded Iraq in the 1980s to steal the stargate from them and gain control over it. Do you think stargates could actually exist? Let me know your wildest theories in the comments below! Egyptian Colony in the Grand Canyon not only is the Grand Canyon one of the most spectacular natural wonders in the world, it's also a magical place that may have once been visited by an advanced civilization. Maybe even the Egyptians. They may have been so far ahead of the curve that they traveled across the globe and set up a great colony on the floor of the Grand Canyon thousands of years ago. We don't know how they may have done this. It's possible they had a navy capable of sailing across the open ocean. Some have even suggested they used portals, like the Stargate I just told you about. It all comes down to a story published in April of 1909 by the Phoenix Gazette. They claimed a necropolis filled with Egyptian mummies and other similar artifacts was discovered in the Grand Canyon. Statues, swords, everything you could think of. It was all found hidden inside of an extremely remote part of the canyon, a part that today is unknown. 
Our closest marker is El Tovar Crystal Canyon, which is supposed to be about two miles from the site of the colony. The story goes that explorers with the Smithsonian Institution found these incredible Egyptian remains hidden in the canyon, but then the artifacts and the pictures were lost, maybe on purpose, as some part of a big conspiracy. There is no way to prove any of this is actually true, though. Plus, scientists with the Smithsonian Institution have denied all authenticity of the claims. Still, there is something mysterious going on in the Grand Canyon. If it wasn't Egyptians who made a colony down there, perhaps it was an even older race of unknown people. The Temple of Ekate. Ekate was the goddess of witchcraft and ghosts. All things magical, creepy, and otherworldly were under her domain. And yet, even though she was a powerful goddess in the Greek pantheon, she never resided on Mount Olympus. She lived in the underworld, where she could go about her ghoulish business in privacy. In Turkey, there is a great temple dedicated to Ekate from 2050 years ago. Because very little of Ekate has been recorded in historic documents, most of what researchers know about her and the cult that followed her comes from the ruins of temples just like this one. But there aren't very many of them around. This temple is arguably the biggest and most important from the ancient world. Normally, Ekate was worshipped in private. Shrines to her have been found at crossroads, with her image carved above doors and thresholds to offer protection to those inside. Seeing as Ekate was the goddess of witches, this shrine must have been a major place of power. Neo-pagans, practitioners of witchcraft, and every would-be necromancer from before the days of Rome would have sought this temple out. But sadly, no evidence has been left behind of their ceremonies or rituals, whatever they may have been. Summoning Spirits at Stonehenge A new theory says that Stonehenge, one of the greatest monuments of the ancient world, was specially designed to summon spirits. We already know how important Stonehenge was to the ancient people. It was clearly a place of great magic. But until now, archaeologists have believed it was used strictly for astronomy. But that may not be the case. Stonehenge may have been a whole lot more magical than anyone could have ever guessed. Believe it or not, it all comes down to sound. New research shows that Stonehenge could have been used as a giant echo chamber to speak directly to the gods. By amplifying their voices, the ancient people who built Stonehenge likely believed they were talking to the very deities they worshipped. According to Stephen J. Waller, a scientific researcher who specializes in archaeology and sound, it goes all the way back to the cavemen. Prehistoric people believed spirits inhabited caves and rocky areas because when they spoke, their voices created echoes. In short, the auditory illusions created by many voices at one time in Stonehenge would have made it seem as if they were summoning the spirits of their ancestors. What do you think of this theory? Let me know in the comments below. Naupawaka High up a mountain in the Peruvian Andes, there is a mysterious archaeological site called Naupawaka. At the site is an entrance carved in the shape of an inverted V directly into the mountainside. The mysterious entrance was cut into the bedrock and does not appear to go anywhere. It's a door to nothing, marked with similar designs that have been seen in Persia and Egypt. We don't know who built Naupawaka. Archaeologists say the design doesn't match anything constructed by the Inca. Whoever carved the entrance into the mountain most likely came before them, maybe even before the Aymara civilization. Archaeologists have never been able to surmise a purpose for the mysterious door, but of course, here are some theories. Some say it was a portal that connected Egypt on the other side of the world with the ancient civilization living in the Andes. And here is yet another bizarre connection between Naupawaka and Egypt. The length to height ratio of the doorway to nowhere is 3 to 1, with the ratio of the alcove being 5 to 6. These ratios match directly to the slopes of the bent pyramid of Egypt. Nobody knows what this significance might mean, but it is a little unusual. Sadly, regular earthquakes in the region have severely damaged the doorway, other mysterious structures in the area, and the temple that once stood there. This has made the mysteries of Naupawaka even more difficult for modern archaeologists to unravel. In the end, professionals dismiss the doorway as nothing but architectural curiosity. It's the more radical researchers who believe it could be a portal. Cave of Evil In an English cave system called the Creswell Crags, hundreds of strange markings were found etched on the walls. Researchers say these were protective markings designed to ward away evil spirits put there by a witch. 
The cave is located in the East Midlands. Until just recently, the markings had actually been written off as graffiti. It wasn't until one of the visitors on a tour noticed they seemed important that academics really took notice. Since then, they've been studied and identified, linked directly to similar markings found in houses, churches, and other caves from between 1550 and 1750. These markings were often used to ward away sickness, death, and malicious spirits. In the case of these caves, the markings were almost certainly etched onto the walls by a witch to keep evil inside. One of the marks was translated roughly to turn away. What researchers believe is that the locals were terrified of some kind of magical evil lurking inside the subterranean cave system. Their solution to the problem, to keep at bay whatever evil terrified them so seriously, was to hire a witch to put magical markings near the entrance. Portal to the Underworld In 2008, a Mexican archaeologist allegedly discovered a forgotten underground cave system that the Maya believed led to the underworld. Archaeologist Guillermo de Anda says a network of tunnels and chambers beneath farmland and jungle on the Yucatan Peninsula was once used by the Maya as sort of a highway through hell. They built temples down here in the grimy dark to mimic the journey through Xibalba, the Mayan underworld. And while there are plenty of mysterious caves throughout the old Maya world, this system is different. There are staircases etched into the natural stone, collapsed altars dedicated to gods of death, swarms of bats, walls of rock sharp as knives, and caverns so cold it feels like you could get hypothermia. Guillermo believes the Maya use these different caves to simulate various stages of the journey every dead person must make when traveling to Xibalba. This journey included things like wading through rivers of bubbling pus, traversing lakes of poisonous scorpions, fighting through caverns of jaguars, and completing other awful trials. Either that, or the Maya quite literally thought that by traveling through these treacherous caves and getting to the end, one may actually walk through a portal and wind up in the underworld. The New Grange Tomb The New Grange Tomb was built 5,000 years ago by a mysterious civilization that even today we know very little about. It's a Neolithic structure in Ireland that can still be used for celebrating the winter solstice all these thousands of years later. Every year, on December 21st, the shortest day of the year, sunlight beams through the main corridor that leads into the chamber of the tomb, flooding 60 feet of stone passage in warm yellow light. Clearly, the people who built the tomb knew what they were doing. Above the structure itself, which is tucked inside a grassy mound, there is a small roof aligned perfectly with the rising sun. Additionally, the central mound is surrounded by 97 stones carved into pieces of megalithic artwork. It's just as striking as the more widely known Stonehenge, but older by several centuries. It probably had a very similar, if not the same, purpose as Stonehenge across the water in England. It was used for spiritual and religious ceremonies, all having to do with the different times of the year and the seasons. We just don't know what those ceremonies looked like. We also don't know much about the ancient people who built it, other than that they were likely a farming community who somehow taught themselves the secrets of the stars. Sigirilla Sigirilla is the most fascinating magical place in all of Sri Lanka. It's an ancient fortress built atop a huge pillar of rock, overlooking endless miles of forest in every direction. It's also known as Lion's Rock, and was once home to a great palace over 600 feet in the air. The only way to the top of the rock is by climbing a great stairway. The stairway starts on the ground, its entranceway jammed between a pair of huge stone lion paws. Archaeologists believe there was a huge lion statue here once, even bigger than the Sphinx in Egypt, but it has since vanished. All that's left are the toes of the feet. The palace at the top was built in the Middle Ages during the Datusena dynasty, but the rock was being used way before that, all the way back in the 3rd century BC by Buddhist monks. They used Sigirilla as a place of meditation. It was considered holy, a great place of spiritual magic that attracted Buddhists from all over the country, even from India. The palace and fortress were used up until the year 495. That was when King Kasapa I was defeated, and Sigirilla was handed back to the Buddhist monks. Shortly after, the Buddhist cult known as Sangha opened one of their most important churches here. Egyptian Priest of Magic Archaeologists in Egypt have just discovered the tomb of an Egyptian priest. 
revealed to be a priest dedicated to magic from 4,500 years ago. The mysterious tomb was uncovered at Abu Sir Archaeological Cemetery in Giza, sealed from the world until its recent discovery. The tomb belonged to someone named Shepseskaf Ankh, who was both a priest and a magician. The tomb was discovered to be enormous, 45 feet long and 13 feet high. The sheer size of the tomb shows just how important this man had been in life during the fifth dynasty of the Old Kingdom. By translating the hieroglyphics on the sealed door of his tomb, experts learned his many titles. He was called Priest of Kunum, Priest of Magic, and was also an important royal physician. If you were able to practice magic in ancient Egypt, you were also able to tend to the medical necessities of royalty. After all, magic and medicine weren't that far apart. If you knew how to heal the body, you were capable of wondrous things. The tomb itself was found in a necropolis between Giza and Saqqara. Even this long ago, Giza had become just too full of monuments. There was no more space to be building pyramids and complex underground tombs. So the builders started straying further and further away, to the lost city of Saqqara. But by now you probably want to know how this man was so magical. How could he be a physician and a wielder of magic at the same time? The truth is that in ancient Egypt, these things were one and the same. Physicians had many different techniques to heal people, and a lot of them had to do with magic. They would speak to the gods, banish curses, mix concoctions out of herbs, whatever they needed to appear effective. The reality is that he probably didn't possess any actual supernatural powers. He probably knew a lot about medicine and combined his scientific knowledge with as much spiritual showmanship as possible. What do you think? Tell me your thoughts in the comments. The Karnak Stones The Karnak Stones is another prehistoric place of magic built by an enigmatic civilization in Europe. These megalithic stones can be found today near the village of Karnak in France. The stones show that whoever built them had an advanced knowledge of geometry, and according to what we know today, this knowledge seems way too advanced for prehistoric people over 5,300 years ago. Experts believe the stones were erected by a group of humans who came even before the Celts. Yet why they bothered putting up over 3,000 standing stones, a task that would have taken years to complete, is a major mystery. Scientists and scholars alike have been trying to decode the Karnak stones with very little success. And to make things even more difficult, many of the stones have vanished. This is due in large part to the site having been generally neglected and even taken over in some areas by sheep. Since the stones have been sitting around for so long, it's likely people stole them to build other projects or if they've just been mostly buried by dirt. What we do know is that the Karnak stones are the biggest collection of megalithic standing stones anywhere on the planet. The entire place was likely treated as a magical center where the community elders taught astrology and astronomy which were probably won back in those days. Some experts believe it's possible the stones were erected in imitation of the stars above, made to mimic constellations in the sky. The Garden of Eden In 1994, a shepherd in eastern Turkey accidentally discovered what very well could be the legendary Garden of Eden. To this day, his accidental discovery of a group of standing stones is considered by some to be the greatest in archaeological history. The site that he found was soon excavated by the famous German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt and is known today as Gobekli Tepe, one of the oldest known archaeological sites anywhere in the world. It's mysterious for a lot of reasons, but mostly its age. Gobekli Tepe is estimated at around 13,000 years old built 7,000 years before Stonehenge and 6,500 years before the pyramids in Giza. Not only is it older than every other major site in the world, it's older by a tremendous margin. This was a time when cavemen were the dominant force and culture. People were still very primitive. It seems ridiculous that they could have built a grand city out of stone when, as far as we know, even language or communication was limited. And yet there is no denying the results of the carbon dating. But here's where things get more magical. There are some who believe Gobekli Tepe was the infamous Garden of Eden spoken of in the Bible. Researchers have discovered inscriptions of boars, ducks, crayfish, lions, and even serpents. Clearly, what is now a barren desert was once flourishing with life. And because the site is so old, it almost seems as if the only way it could have been built on Earth was if God, or the gods, came down and built it themselves for humans to enjoy. The Enchanted River 
Deep in the jungles of the Philippines, there is a mystical stretch of river that comes out of virtually nowhere and sends its water flowing into the sea. It's called the Hinatuan Enchanted River, located in Mindanao. The saltwater river is 80 feet deep in some parts and hardly long enough to even be considered a river. Yet it has been seen as a place of miracles since antiquity. Because the river looks as though it comes out of the ground and has no visible source, the ancient people who lived here believed it was magical in origin. Even modern scientists don't know exactly where the salt water comes from. Most theories say there is an underground cave system that shoots the river literally out of the earth, but this has never been confirmed. What makes it even more mysterious is that the river is totally clear, much like a freshwater spring would be. The river was never said to have any particular magic, Instead, there are a lot of elaborate legends surrounding it. Locals say fairies once dumped sapphires and jade pieces into the water, turning it shades of blue and green. They also say the river is home to a magical fish that nobody can catch. Want to give a big shout out to Diane Suisfo and Danny Green KP. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the Origins Explained family. Sweden's Island of Witches. These days, the Swedish island of Bladjungfrun is a national park, but many years ago it was believed to be a terrifying place of horrors where witches allegedly practiced evil magic. According to some archaeological discoveries made in the past few years, this might actually be true. The island itself is in the Baltic Sea, nothing but a small chunk of blue granite less than a mile long. It's been an ominous place for as far back as the local folklore goes. Its original name was Blakula. However, locals refused to say it because they believed as soon as you said the island's name, it would create a series of storms that could wipe out ships. In the 16th century, witches were said to gather on the island the day before Good Friday to meet the devil. As if that wasn't bad enough, the rest of the year, the island was home to female supernatural beings. These beings had the power to harm or help. Some people would secretly travel to the island and leave offerings on its shores in a desperate attempt to gain favor with the mysterious beings. But some people wanted the beings to use their power to cause others harm. The evidence of this is in the form of a labyrinth. The ruins of a strange stone labyrinth can still be found on the island today. No one knows where it came from or who built it, and nobody knows what its purpose was. But the locals suspect it was somehow connected to the witches and their nefarious deeds. Mayong The ancient village of Mayong was once the black magic capital of India. The quiet village sits on the edge of the Brahmaputra River and looks like any other village in the region. But its origin goes back to the days of ancient Assam. It's mentioned in the mythological epic the Mahabharata, a religious text that tells the story of some of Hinduism's gods and goddesses and an epic battle amongst heroes and gods alike. It's a book filled with stories and legends that live on to this day. In the book, the village of Mayong is where Chief Gatot Kacha received magical powers. From this ancient story, myths around the villages began to form. Even in modern times, locals believe witches live in the dense jungles outside the village and continue to practice black magic. There are other suspicious activities that have happened in the city as well. The villagers can tell you countless stories of men vanishing into thin air, people turning into wild beasts, and even one instance of a witch making an entire group of over 100,000 horsemen disappear. Naturally, there is no proof of these wild tales, but for over a thousand years, Mayong has been seen as a dark and magical place in India, somewhere most locals apparently avoid. Mount Olympus We have all undoubtedly heard of Mount Olympus, the heavenly home of all the most important Greek gods in the classical pantheon. Zeus reigned over Mount Olympus, accompanied by his wife Hera, his brother Poseidon, his sisters, his children, and all the Olympians from mythology. Have you ever wondered where Mount Olympus actually is? And for that matter, is it really a place of magic? There are several peaks in Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus, all named Olympus. But the one with the most credibility is near the city of Thessaloniki in the north of Greece, the tallest mountain range in the whole country. The highest peak here is 9,570 feet tall. Since before the days of Christianity, the mountain has been considered sacred. It was once believed to exude spiritual power. It was so famous that it drew hermits and monks from all over Europe to live in its caves and forests. It wasn't until the coming of Christianity when people stopped visiting the holy mountain. 
These days, the only magic left on Olympus is its natural splendor. There are very few pilgrims, the forests are quiet, and people have given up believing in Zeus and his kin. Black Magic Worship Historians discovered an underground worship chamber used in magical pagan ceremonies 40 feet beneath an old Roman ruin. It was built by a mysterious cult who painted the walls of the chamber an eerie blood red. The chamber dates back at least 2,000 years and is located beneath the streets of Rome. It was uncovered by accident in 1917 during the construction of a new railway line on the outskirts of the city. An underground passageway collapsed, revealing the entrance to the secret chamber. Its walls were found covered in pictures of gods and heroes from classical mythology, such as Achilles and Hercules. At the entrance is the imposing and gruesome head of Medusa, as well as carvings of centaurs and satyrs. It predates Christianity and is so far the only one of its kind ever found. This is one of the most bizarre magical places in Rome, a pagan basilica built underground. In the first century BC, historians believe it was used as a school for mystical teachings based on the philosophical writings of Pythagoras and Plato. It was likely built by an influential Roman family headed by Titus Statilius Taurus. This man was investigated by the Senate for practicing black magic and conducting secret illicit ceremonies underground. He never went to trial because he was found dead shortly after the accusations in the year 53. After that, his fellow cultists had to go even deeper underground. The basilica was sealed, forgotten, and buried under the streets of Rome. Thanks for watching! Which of these magical places sounds most likely to contain actual magic? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you next time for more incredible archaeological videos. Bye!